please welcome the panel. Hi, everybody. Welcome back from break. I hope everyone's still with us as the afternoon progresses. Uh, we do have a great panel here. We're going to dive right in. Um, Daryl, I thought I would start with you um, and try to get your thoughts on how you go about uh, elevating, uh, you know, a perhaps originally transactional deal beyond, say, the deal terms and make it into a strategic partnership. Well, uh, when we think about strategic partnerships, we don't start thinking really about the deal terms at all because to us when we consider strategic partnerships, we have to keep in mind that we only have finite resources and we have to decide where we're really going to focus from a strategic standpoint. And so the selection process for us, we can only have so many partners and we have a number of partners that we have that kind of level of relationship with, but it has to be something for us that isn't going to provide just the simple benefits of a media transaction. It has to provide something that's a higher level strategic benefit, not just to our clients, which are obviously at the center of all the decisions that we make, but frankly, the way I look at it is what is it going to do for our organization? How is it going to elevate us? How is it going to introduce us and help us push uh, our organization harder to take on new concepts and new ways of working so that we stay on a bleeding edge? Because that not only provides a benefit to our clients, but it provides a benefit to our credentials as an organization and helps us grow so that we can perform for more and more um, uh, clients. And certainly, the collaboration that we have at uh, Facebook is a great example of, uh, of that. And beyond that, we were um, you know, fortunate enough over the past uh, six months or so, maybe nine months or so, to expand that with um, uh, Instagram. And which is something that's very close to, uh, to our hearts uh, at Omnicom Media Group. Because as we look at the, the, the social landscape and we see uh, all of the benefits that we can drive from um, uh, the data that we accrue from that, uh, from that environment, we also want to keep in mind, um, as we look at our client base, uh, the power of building brands. And for us, Instagram, the power of the image uh, the power of the size of the image on the screen and what we could do from that at the top of the funnel and uh, have that complement and help drive the bottom even more effectively was a very important part of uh, us building the, uh, uh, the relationship with Facebook. And I'm, I'm happy to say that that uh, collaboration, it requires you know, a level of uh, passion amongst our people. You need to have a team that's really prepared to in, uh, in, in, engage on it. Um, but uh, working with Carolyn and, uh, and her team has been fantastic. And it's even you know, evolved to a point where um, after, as we were putting our, um, the structure of our partnership together, we were helping mold um, really the offer of Instagram to uh, other uh, clients, whether Omnicom Media Group or otherwise. So really um, a strong example of partnership. But you get, kind of got to be all in. You got to believe what can this do for our organization and uh, bet on those few partnerships. Uh, you three have all uh, worked together a lot. Your companies uh, have done some great executions over the last few years. Uh, how do each of you approach strategic partnerships within your organizations? Well, I have to tell you, um, I have to echo what Daryl said. Um, strategic partnerships are about, you know, that one plus one equals three, okay? And, you know, for us uh, at PepsiCo, what's really, really important is when we work with a strategic partner, the first thing that we look at is how do we align on the same goal or outcome? Because we all have different perspectives, we all have different needs, we all have different um, uh, you know, strategies that we're trying to go after. But when you can unite on the outcome, and when that outcome is mutually beneficial, unbelievable things happen. And um, time and time again, you know, whether it be OMD who came to us, who said, you know what, you gotta look at Facebook, not just because it's a mass reach vehicle, but it, it offers so much more strategic opportunity. And they really helped us see what that unlock was. And then when you sit down with Facebook and you really see that this is more than just an engagement building platform, but a business building platform, then all of a sudden you start having unbelievable conversations. And I think from, from our perspective, you know, we're, we don't have a business unless we're growing 
their business, right? And Daryl's team and Facebook's team have to grow Ann's business at Frito-Lay and PepsiCo more broadly. And so we are very focused on being a listening organization, not a sales organization. I can't stand the notion of having a bunch of media sellers that pitch Ann or Daryl or their team about selling impressions because you can have that anywhere. What we're trying to do is be business advisors and consultants and the way I evaluate my team is do they deserve a badge from either one of their, our partners, meaning do they actually get a company badge so that they are really representing the interests of PepsiCo or Omnicom? And that's how I evaluate my team, not have they just sold the latest and greatest thing. And that's how we approach it. So it's about trust, it's about collaboration. And the thing I will say is it's often hard to say, here are the different companies you could potentially have strategic partnerships with, because it actually comes down to the people. Right, Anne saw the power of what we could do together between Omnicom and Facebook and led the charge for Frito-Lay North America. And now we have some really fantastic examples from that. But it wasn't just the company, it was the people in it. And the same thing goes um, at Omnicom. And so I really think it comes down to people and it's very hard to actually select which companies you can have strategic partners with when it's really who is sitting across the table from you. Have there been some major marketers where you said, look, this chemistry is just not working? We're We'd love to do an enormous amount of business with you, but it's not gonna be like that. I think it's not chemistry, it's around willingness to try new things, willingness to be courageous, and that is very difficult. I, and, and I'm very empathetic when companies are trying to grow single-digit growth and have enormous pressure, um, whether it be currency pressure or commodity pressure, whatever that might be, sometimes it is much easier to go with things that you know have worked over the last 10, 15 years. And so it might be timing. It's usually mm -hmm. not chemistry, mm -hmm. it's usually timing. And you know what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a business that's gonna be here way past when I'll be here and way past when my team will be here, which means we'll be patient. And when the timing is right and people feel um, the trust that they can do something bold, then we're ready to partner with them. And I mean, we're talking a lot about goals and we're talking about timeframes already. With a strategic partnership, do you, do you necessarily have to put the, the immediate ROI that you often care a lot about or get asked about at your quarterly meeting on the back burner? Uh, or is that too strong? What's your time frame to evaluate a strategic partnership and how soon do you need those results? So again, every industry is gonna be different, but let me tell you mine and the category we compete in. We're a fast moving category, right? Very high frequency. And recency of loyalty is a real big issue in our category. And so I don't have the luxury of waiting 12, 18 months to hopefully pay off. That's another thing that Carolyn was talking about, which is in a strategic partnership, I have to be very upfront about these are my ROI metrics. And if, if, if our partner can't figure out how to be creative, come up with different ways of working with me, then I can't be a strategic partner. And one of the things that I think has been an unbelievable unlock, um, our partnership along with Data Logics, and, and what that has been able to do to um, really make ROI accountable to both Facebook as well as PepsiCo. And as a result, I can literally measure every dollar that I'm spending with Facebook. And I have to tell you, I can't tell you the numbers, sorry, I don't have to kill you, but I'm so proud about where that ROI is. And let me also say one other thing. When you talk strategic partnerships, it's not just a nice to do. You gotta put your money where your mouth is. And with Facebook, you know, our spending with Facebook has quadrupled in three years. And you know, we are well above the industry average and that's because Facebook came to the table and said, what is it gonna take to move your business, measure it and have the entire organization stand behind it? That's a strategic partnership. So, so it's a long-term partnership that may outlast perhaps your team or um, you know, our time in the business, but it's got very small increments along the way in which it has to be performing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Wait, can, if I can jump in, Nat, I also think that at the center of that, and you can hear it in what Ann is saying, it, it, a true strategic partnership that it takes the relationship to a different level requires courage as well. Right, so what, uh, what we're talking about here are business measures. You know, if, if you enter a, I would say, a conventional uh, partnership arrangement, we're talking about media measures. And um, uh, two, true strategic partnerships take off when we can move the conversation 
to a business measure, and we have a client, and certainly Anne is an example of that, that has the courage uh, and the will and the belief that uh, ROI and the business can be driven and will be driven um, uh, by the work that's, uh, work that's done. That's a very important part of a strategic partnership that you're really working together to drive business ahead as opposed to you know, get more GRPs or a lower CPM or more impressions. I mean, yeah. it, it's got to yeah. be, you've got to be comfortable with failure. you got to be comfortable with taking risks. And I have no issue with failure. If something doesn't work, Carol and I have talked about it, we know how to measure that and why it didn't work so we know exactly what to do differently the next time. It's that iterative learning that also makes for a strong strategic partnership. So you got to take some risks and uh, you got to be able to invent as you go. I think what, what both Ann and Daryl are touching on, though, is a willingness to look at our business based on business outcomes, and as opposed to the traditional media metrics that a lot of our business is transacted on every day, GRP, CPM, so on and so forth. At the end of the day, what Ann cares about is market share, mm -hmm. right? Are we moving market share dramatically or incrementally, depending on which product line we're working on, because that's how her business is, is being evaluated. And so we want to be completely aligned with we are focused on driving market share. It might be top of the funnel um, needs that happen to be based on what the product offering is. It might be, no, look, we need to move product market share in the next 30 days, and this is a critical selling period for us. And we just want to be held accountable for whatever that business outcome is, more than to what I would call traditional media metrics. And it takes partners that are willing to have a different conversation to actually talk about. Everyone says, oh, yes, it would be nice to be measured on business outcomes. But it's hard for people to actually adjust the organization and say, no, that, this is the direction we're going. Let's talk about uh, some of the specific work that you guys have done together. Uh, the Lay's Do Us a Flavor program, I think a lot of people in the audience are probably familiar with. I think that was very popular and a great use of Facebook. So let's talk about what that was and how Facebook brought something to it. You know, the beauty of working at PepsiCo is um, I steal shamelessly from other parts of the company. And Lay's Do Us a Flavor was actually done in the United Kingdom almost 10 years ago. And it was an amazing success. But it was also very specific to the UK market. And so seven years later, we're bringing it to the United States. And you have to understand, Lay's is a behemoth brand, okay? It's the world's largest food brand. I don't think a lot of people know that. And so trying to make it relevant and fresh and and something that people actually want to talk about, not easy to do. And so bringing this idea, and for those of you who don't know, it's basically us asking the consumers, what's the next flavor of Lay's? It's as simple as that. And what are some of the flavors that people have come up with? <laughs> <laughs> Bacon's very popular. Oh, of um, course, yeah. But you know, like our first year, you know, we had uh, things like chicken and waffles, and uh, we've had sriracha, and we've had uh, the one that won this year, which was uh, ginger and wasabi. Amazing if you haven't had it. Mm. Um, it's better when you mix them all together, too. But anyway, that's a side note. And so um, here is a proposition that now you've got to figure out how do you get people engaged, right? And here's the insight about people. They could give a shit about lace. They really do. They don't wake up every morning saying, I can't wait to have a lace. They don't care about that, right? What do they care about? They care about their lives. They care about their friends. They care about their conversations. They care about what they talk about on Facebook. So, that's where the creativity got unlocked. And this notion of creating tools that not only do you get to nominate a flavor, but right there live on Facebook, you get a package of your flavor. It goes into your news feed. All of a sudden, we created these tools where people can compete with their friends. My flavor's better than yours. Um, these flavor analyzers, like they, they would go into, again, with opting in, with permission, but if they went into kind of what, where's the latest restaurants you went to? What did you post on Facebook? We use that as inspiration to give them ideas. All of a sudden, guys, they're not even, they're talking about their lives and Lay's is going in for the ride. And so, you know, the first year that we did it, you know, based on how it did in other markets, we thought, eh, maybe we'll get like a million submissions. We got four million. So then I went to my team and I said, you sandbag me, okay? So the second year we did it, I said, I want to see at least double. Second year, we got 14 million submissions and we had to shut it off. Like, we just couldn't handle the volume. And what it speaks to is not only is it an amazing program that had amazing ROI for a behemoth brand like Lay's, I think the real secret of it was, was that we used a platform uh, in a very creative way that allowed people to have another excuse to talk to each other. And at the end of the day, that's what really matters. 
When you, when you start a program like that, how often are strategic partners talking? I mean, I guess when you start it, I would imagine 24 hours a day. But over time, are there ways, practical ways that you keep your team working well together? Do you have check-ins on a weekly basis, on the phone, in person? How do you keep this all moving along so that there aren't disappointments or miscommunications that blow the whole thing up? Well, I, I think from a, you know, there are, there are two levels of this from a, uh, from an agency standpoint in terms of the strategic partnership. You're deciding that it is a, a strategic imperative that we're going to work on this because it's going to provide value to the organization and to our relationships with, uh, uh, with, with clients. And that is really where the onus is on the leadership to say this is a, is a, is a priority as we're parsing um, the time that we have um, and, and using it effectively. Um, and, uh, and the relationship tends to be at a mid to high level um, on that and an organizational level and priorities get, uh, get set. But when it comes down to work on an individual piece of, piece of business, that's when the relationship really has to click in on a daily basis because you know, the, it, it's all in the details in terms of getting this work done right, particularly when we're exploring new areas uh, for, a, uh, for a brand and looking at ROI performance and monitoring that very carefully and how are the messages delivering. Um, it, it really is uh, daily communication. And the communication doesn't always work out right, but it, 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 it's an absolute necessity. It's also a necessity, um, I believe, uh, as we, as when we head down a path like this, when we're testing new ways of measuring performance of, uh, of, of brands for the client to very much be an advocate of making the strategic partnership work. Because, because if that's not there, ultimately, we're not really going to test the edges of what's possible from an ROI standpoint. It's the client that gives us the confidence, frankly, uh, to work with them and, uh, and, and, and pull together everything we know about our relationship with the partnership and deploy it um, for them, critical part of it. Confidence seems like a, a key point. I mean, sometimes when you guys are working together on extremely creative ideas and really adding value to each other and like the good stuff is flowing, it must seem kind of easy. Other times there's uh, areas that are more sensitive. You know, data is always uh, a subject that agencies and media vendors and clients have to figure out how they want to navigate. How, how do you, for example, figure out what you want to share and what you want to protect and how much you trust each other? Well. From our point of view, we never share personally identifiable information. So period, end of story. Um, that privacy is the foundation of Facebook and the trust that we have with the people that use it. So that's first. We look at data really in a couple of different ways. I'd say three different ways. One is what kind of insights can we aggregate out of the platform to help Anne and her team be better marketers on Facebook? How can we give them insights to understand what women are talking about, what may be passionate right now with millennials, whatever audience that she's interested in. We work very closely with OMD and Anne's team to provide insights. And I think as a, as a whole, we, we have a lot more work to do as a company. We're getting better at doing that, but we know that there's a big unlock there to help people get insights. The second thing that we do is just help targeting. So in the do us a flavor example, with Lay's, we could actually help Frito-Lay target people that had participated and voted over the prior two years to re-engage them. We could find them on Facebook. We could use data logics to understand who has purchased snack foods in the last X number of months, depending on, on their guidance, and help them find those people on Facebook. So we use data to be very sophisticated around targeting. And then the third is using data for measurement, right? At the end of the cycle, how do we prove through really conversion lift, experimental design, take group A, group B, that should be very similar characteristics, showcase group A, the ads from Frito-Lay, and group B does not see them, and what's the actual lift? And so those are the three ways. Are we giving better insights? Are we helping to target better? And are we helping to measure? Um, and that's how we think about it. And, and I would tell you, ways that, you know, as, as a client, I can leverage that data is, is very powerful for me. Um, so, you know, in our portfolio, if you just look at our snacks portfolio, we have, you know, multi-billion dollar brands like Lay's, and I have hundred million dollar brands like Stacy's. And Stacy's is a much more targeted, smaller brand, and back to the point about leveraging data the right way and targeting the right way, and then partnering with, like, the Spark uh, process that really leverages the creative um, assets that Facebook has to offer, there, I've now found a way to, in a very targeted basis, create scale and efficiency 
that there's no way I could replicate had I just taken the Lay's model and applied it to Stacy's. And so when I'm constantly thinking about ROI, every dollar is held prisoner, those things matter, and that's why a relationship, a relationship like this becomes very powerful. Um, I've, I've seen uh, strategic partnerships uh, compared to trying to sail ships uh, in, <laughs> along the same course as the wind changes and the tides and the, the currents and all the rest. How do you guys keep yourselves going on the same general trajectory? Um, how much of that is collaboration? How much of that comes down to some kind of hierarchy? There's a boss, ultimately, yes, in the middle here. Um, how does that mix work best? You, can, you cannot underestimate the power of the, uh, of the client in okay. terms of keeping the ship sailing in the right direction and being the adult in the room as well as we, uh, as we, as we build the relationships. Um, uh, it's, it, 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 it's the difference between uh, you know, good results and great results. Um, it, re it really is. It's, it's, it's the difference between competitive results and outstanding competition beating performance um, at, at, at the end of the day. So, um, look, there are a, a lot of uh, 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 agencies from a creative standpoint, from a social standpoint, from a media standpoint that can participate in strategic partnerships, but ultimately there has to be one North Star. There has to be a, you know, a belief in where we're all going together and what the contribution is, go is going to be. And when you have that kind of leadership uh, that uh, clearly we've, uh, we've had in the uh, Lay's example um, is what, what makes it work. And if you don't have that, you're stumbling around. I, I, there's one thing I, I think is a secret sauce that you know, kind of gets lost in all of this that I really want to talk about, which is, at the end of the day, we're a people business. And you cannot underestimate the power of people. And one of the things that I talk a lot about in these strategic partnership is how am I going to cast for the right people to work on something like this? Because at this level, look, there's a lot of talented people in an organization. That's great, that's kind of the ante. But what you gotta find are those warriors, those people who have passion, the people who know how to take it to the next level who, you know, we're not on a conference call every week. We, you know, we get together, we love each other, but, you know, let's face it, I'm, I'm not, you know, we're not, they don't have time for me. And um, so <laughs> what I need is to create a network of people who are cast for that role. Um, later on, there's, a, there's a, a panel that you guys will see, and I'll give you two examples of how I've cast. Our vice president of marketing, Jeff Klein, is gonna be on, on stage with Kristen mm -hmm. Colonna who heads up the OMD relationship for us, two, I couldn't think of two better people, you know, just get out of their way, let them go at it. My other senior director, Ashwin Nathan's here, who is a digital mastermind. And the biggest and best thing that you can do in a strategic partnership, leave them alone. Mm -hmm. Let them go at it, trust your people. Um, you guys are also all global powers um, who have to ex execute in local markets in, in a smart way. And I know that another example that you guys have done together is the, the Pepsi Max work in the, in the UK. Could one of you tell me about what that campaign looked like? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll tee it off. You're wearing blue. Um, Go I'm for wearing it. blue, so I'll, I'll represent Pepsi Max. Um, so in, the, in Europe, vacations are very popular in the summertime and Pepsi was really trying to reimagine the way they would speak to their core audience um, in the UK. And so they first enlisted our support in what we call a publishing garage, which is we have a very small creative shop team that worked closely with the Pepsi Max brand team and OMD, and in fact Arnold at the time on the creative side, and developed a really fantastic creative execution um, that was in video format. And then the real big challenge for Pepsi Max in the UK was how do we reach, how do they reach their target audience during the summer when people are not sitting in front of desktops, not watching traditional media, but frankly on the beach and on holiday with their families. And they realized the big unlock for them was it has to be mobile and it needs to be mobile video to tell a story, to really bring the brand to life. And so a beautiful two minute film, which was fantastic with a uh, magician that literally shocked people in the UK because he was literally riding on the red bus, looked like he had no support, no one figured out how to do it. So it was a great piece of creative. It was engaging. It was what we call thumb stopping creative at Facebook, which is as you're flipping through your news feed, what is going to make you stop? What's gonna make the thumb stop and actually engage? And it was a terrific example of brand building at the upper funnel, target audience, and the recognition that this audience is not sitting in front of 
not only traditional media, but the desktop, right? Because there would have been alternative places to place the video. Um, and then they realized the Pepsi Max and OMD team said it's got to be front and center on people's mobile device. And then we became uh, the platform. So they reached half of the UK audience mm -hmm. within a couple of days, which is a very effective way. I mean, each day in the UK, we have about 21 million people on mobile devices. And so for a brand like Pepsi Max, it's a very efficient way to do brand building. In these partnerships, uh, I don't know whether it's easier at the beginning or, or as you uh, get to know each other better, do you ever find yourself saying, you know, that's not working, that's not working as well as I thought it was going to, or there's an opportunity we didn't predict, and doing a real course correction a week or two into some campaign, is there a way to stay nimble even though you've got such big partners working on pretty elaborate campaigns? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, in, in our world, I think that, you know, what is the next rung? Kind of what's the next, um, you know, kind of pillar that we're going to go after? And I will tell you, this notion of being able to um, um, really understand consumers at a one-on-one -on -one basis and really being able to, um, back to your point about understanding what works for one versus another. And, you know, every manufacturer is trying to come up with their kind of proprietary way of looking at data and, 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 and being able to uh, understand how they can control that. And so I think at the end of the day, what, what we have to learn is, you know, how do we get to that next level where it's that intersection of um, what I call granularity with scale. Hmm. And that intersection point is the next um, kind of summit. And uh, we've got to start again figuring out some um, courageous ways of breaking some of those sound barriers um, because we're getting into a market, especially like in the United States, that you know, growth has, has is slowed down and you've got to find those pockets of granular growth. If you go globally, that's a very different model. And so if, if, if media partners and if um, uh, manufacturers are not willing to be nimble to be able to understand what that next summit looks like, um, we're going to become irrelevant very quickly. We change course a lot. Um, we innovate our product offerings, our solution offerings. And when we need to innovate and be nimble, it really comes down to our teams knowing that they've got, A, the support of the leadership saying this is really important. And at the end of the day, we've got to do what's right for growing Ann's business, right? That's what we're aligned on. And so if that means changing course or something's not working as well, being, having the trust, the open collaboration, the frank discussions. When I sit with Ann and Daryl, it's not about, well, tell us how everything is, how great everything is. Like, I want to know what are all the things we're doing wrong? Like, how do I fix these things? Because that's the only way we get better. And status quo is just not acceptable in, in, in our culture. You guys are all starting to, to address the question I wanted to go out with, which was, how do you keep a partnership as it, as it gets a little more familiar and goes on over a few years, uh, fresh and, and inspiring for, for you guys. Are, are there ways you can build in injections of new energy? Are, are there ways that you guys keep this from getting stale? I, I, th I think that's hard to, you know, it, it depends on the partnership, right? And mm -hmm. in terms of how it moves ahead. I think the partnership that, that we're talking about here today, though, is in such a fresh space, I have to say that um, as we look at different kinds of categories that are participating in different wi kinds of ways, what we're seeing today, uh, particularly with greater use of video on, on all, of the, all of the platforms, is there's almost a fire hose of learnings that we're, that we're, uh, that we're getting in this space today. Uh, as I said, across different kind of categories, whether it's from retail to brand, whatever, whatever the case may be, and really unique and innovative ways of connecting even conventional media to, uh, to, to social media to improve ROI in really uh, significant ways. So I think in this particular space, where we are with Facebook and a strategic partnership, there's such a fire hose that I'm not too concerned about keeping it fresh for the, yeah. uh, for at least the foreseeable away. future. Yeah. 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 What I would say is uh, the way to keep it fresh for me personally is, you know, I'm always trying to write the next chapter of the book um, that has not been written. Um, and so for me, a strategic partnership is what's the next chapter we're going to write together that no one's tried before, because that's where that's where our edge comes from, our competitive advantage comes from. And you know, I'll give you one example. We always talk about engagement as a consumer engagement. Again, another partnership with Facebook, you know, we took that platform to our retailers. And we've worked with the Walmarts of the world. And all of a sudden, we, PepsiCo, are coming to our retailers with a program that is just as unique and, and compelling 
that moves their business with their shoppers, albeit with our brands, I'm okay with that, but that's a different way, that's a new uh, summit that we're scaling together. And every year, if I don't see that new summit, that's, that's where, the, where the partnership becomes stale. Mm -hmm. Anything? I would just say innovation. We think about our partnership with pillars, and innovation is just core. It's core to the DNA for all of us, for each of our discussions, and so be it the retailer relationship, be it Instagram, and be it whatever the future has to hold, we're accountable for coming to our partners with what we think is the really defining the future of marketing, and so that's how we approach it. Great, thank you guys very much. It's been a great panel, Thank real you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.